Milkweed by Jerry Spinelli, Chapter 6. Yuri and I walked outside the next morning to see how it was different. The tanks were gone. The jackboots were strolling about just like us. They looked at the people and spoke to each other. I couldn't stop staring at them. A crowd was running. We turned a corner. There was a large truck with the back open. Soldiers were tossing loaves of bread. The people grabbed and scrambled. We munched our cheeses, watching. I was fascinated. I had not known bread could be given. We walked on. We came to another crowd of people gathered around something on the sidewalk. Don't, said Yuri. But I did. I squeezed my way to the front. There was a man in a long black coat on his hands and knees. He had a long gray beard. Beside him was a bucket of water. He was dipping his beard inside into the water and scrubbing the sidewalk with the beard. A pair of jackboot soldiers stood above him laughing. Some of the people were laughing too. The man in black was not laughing. I came back to Yuri. I tugged on his arm. Come see. There's a man cleaning the sidewalk with his beard. Yuri smacked my head. You are stupid. He pulled me away. Farther on, we saw something else that made us stop. Two soldiers were standing in front of something else. Was standing in front of another bearded man in black. One of the soldiers had a pair of scissors. He was cutting off the man's beard and the black hair that came curling down over his ears. I ran up to the soldiers. Bring him to our place, I said. We live in a barber shop. He can sit in our red chair. We have better bottles of hair tonic. The soldiers stared at me. Yuri grabbed me. He said words to them that I could not understand. The soldiers laughed. Yuri yanked me away. We heard the soldiers laughing behind us. I thought, men in beards and long black coats do not laugh. Later that day, we sat on our beds eating chocolate babkas. Yuri said, stay away from jackboots. They smile, I said. They hate you. I laughed. They don't hate me. They say, very good, little gypsy. They salute me. I want to be a jackboot. He smacked me in the face. My babka went flying. You're not a jackboot. You'll never be a jackboot. You are what you are. I gathered up my babka. Still, I wanted to be right about something. The people love the tanks, I said. They ran to see them. They watched. They hate the tanks. Someone threw a flower. He gave a snort. Coward. If the jackboots say kiss the tanks behind, some people will do it. I laughed, thinking of a tanks behind. As I lay in bed that night, Yuri's voice came through the darkness. You need a name. I have one, I said. A real one. Why, I doubted him. You should have one, that's all. I want to know what to call you. Call me stupid. He laughed. You don't remember what your parents called you? I don't remember parents. We were silent. I moved my fingertip over my yellow stone. I remembered a booming laugh and, la and bright colors, the smell of horse and the taste of something sweet, riding someone's shoulder and hair glittering in firelight. At last, Yuri's voice came again. I had a little brother. Is he dead, I said? Yes, I think so. He must be. Did he have a name? Joseph. Was he little like me? He was, and growing fast. Do you remember your parents? Yes, but less and less. I asked in the darkness, do you remember riding a shoulder? But no answer came. I closed my eyes, and I thought over and over of Yuri's words, you are what you are. Which is what, I wondered. In my mind, I saw the man in black scrubbing the sidewalk with his beard, and the other man and the laughing soldiers with the scissors. Snip, snip, and the hair falling to the sidewalk black hair falling. My eyes popped open, though in the darkness there is nothing to see. They're Jews, I blurted. Yuri snorted. Who says you're stupid? Chapter 7. Those were the good times. Our ice box, our cellar shelves were full of food. We ate peaches and brandy and peanut butter and caviar sandwiches. We ate apples and lemon, Danish, and cheese puffs, and hickory smoked trout. We ate candy all day long. My favorite was buttercream with a hazelnut inside. There was usually only one to a candy box, and often not even that, and I was not good at telling them on sight. So I broke open chocolates by the hundreds, searching for, any, for my prize. I raced through candy chorus of, Stop! Thief! At home, I frantically dug for hazelnut buttercreams, flinging the rest aside. Yuri scolded me for wasting. Except for the candy, he made me finish eating everything I started. As for Yuri, he loved pickles. 
big, fat, juicy pickles. They floated in barrels of brine in grocery stores. The urge would strike him suddenly. He would pop up. Let's go, pickle run. We went on so many pickle runs because Yuri would eat only fresh pickles. If a pickle had been out of the brine more than a day, he stuck his nose up at it. This meant we had to keep find, finding new stores. No one ever saw him take anything, but after a while, a grocer would begin to notice that whenever a certain red-haired boy came into the store, pickles disappeared. On the way to a pickle place, I was not allowed to snatch anything. Yuri did not want his pickle run spoiled by a snatch and run. But on the way back, as he contentedly ate his prize, I was allowed to do as I wished. Yuri ch usually took things from store shelves and counters, except for candy I took from people. We would be strolling along, pickle juice from Yuri's chin spattering the sidewalk, when I would see something and take it. Off I went, weaving through the crowds of people, while Yuri marched away, pretending he didn't know me. Back home, he would say, how did you do that? I would shrug, I just do it. You're amazing, he would say, and I would feel like a buttercream with a hazelnut heart. Sometimes Yuri went out alone. Scouting, he called it. He told me to stay put. One time I did not stay put. It was not long after the jackboots came. I got it into my head to go to the Grand Boulevard and see the parade again. That's what I believed. The parade was never ending. It went on day and night, and I was missing it. I climbed out of the cellar and started running, but when I came to the Grand Boulevard, there was no parade. There were streetcars and automobiles and people upon people, but no parade. I saw two jackboots walking. I ran up to them. Where's the parade? The tall one laughed. You're five days late. It's over. I tried to understand. Are the tanks gone? Not gone. Yuri says you hate me, I told them, but I don't believe him. Good. I want to be a jackboot someday. The tall one said something to the other, but I could not understand the words. He reached down and ran his fingers through my short hair. Some day, dark little boy. Are you a Jew? No, I said. I'm a gypsy. Are you a Jew? Again he smiled and said something to the other who did not smile. Let's hope not, he said, and they walked on. I saw a lady car carrying cream puffs. Don't ask me how I knew they were cream puffs. It was a white pastry box like any other, wrapped in white spring. I just had a sense about those things. Maybe it came from snatching food for as long as I could remember. I was coming up behind her. She wore a red coat as the air was chilly. The seams of her stockings were perfect black lines running from her heels to the hem of her coat. Her blonde hair spilled from a little black hat. The pastry box dangled from one hand. She was not a screamer. Not everyone was. After I snatched the box, I heard no screams behind me. No footsteps either. She was not a chaser. Still, I ran. I always ran. I did not know how not to run. That was my life. I snatched, I ran, I ate. So I was running. Chased by myself, you might say, and I turned a corner and was suddenly flat on my back. I had run into someone, a boy with one arm. Gypsy, he cried. My cream puffs, I cried. They were scattered about the sidewalk. So were his cherry turnovers. He reached for a cream puff and threw it at my face. I threw one at him. We laughed and scooped vanilla cream puff filling from our cheeks and ate it. We scooped vanilla ch filling and cherry goop from the sidewalk, and what we didn't eat we flung at each other, and in between we fell onto our backs and laughed. Walkers veered into the street to avoid us. Well, well, came a voice. Little thieves. It was a jackboot grinning down at us, and we were gone. Fast as flies. One arm one way, me another. The jackboot's laughter fading. I ran down alleyways. I didn't recognize where I was, but it didn't matter. I was in the city, the only world I knew. I came to a garden. Some people had little gardens in their backyards. The gardens were all brown stalks and stubble and fallen leaves by now. And so was this one, except for one, one viney upshoot of green and red. It was a tomato plant, probably the last surviving one of the season. I knew something of seasons, but nothing of months and years. I had no use for them. I know now that this must have happened in the month of October, in the year 1939. Many green tomatoes dangled from the vine, and two plump, ripe red ones. I was still hungry. I pulled off a red tomato, sat myself down cross-legged on the ground, and ate it. The juice spilled down my chin, as pickle juice often did on Yuri. I picked off the other tomato. As I was eating it, I turned my eyes toward the back of the house. Someone was sitting on the step, a little girl, watching me. I never ate with someone watching me, unless it was Yuri or the boys. 
Eating came after running, and yet I didn't move. I sat there and ate the last red tomato in the city, and I watched her watching me. Her elbows were on her knees, and her face leaned into her cupped hands. Her hair was curly and the color of bread crust. Her eyes were brown as chestnuts. They were very big. When I finished eating the tomato, I stood and walked off. I didn't run. When I looked back, she was still watching me. Her round, unblinking eyes made me feel as if I had just become visible, as if I had never been seen before. When I was far from the backyard, I kept looking back. When I told Yuri I found two red tomatoes and ate them, he didn't believe me. On the first day that the lights went out, Yuri said to me, Okay, this is who you are. Your name is Misha Pilsudski. And he told me the rest. I, Misha Pilsudski, was born a gypsy somewhere in the land of Russia. My family, including two great-grandfathers and a great-great-grandmother, who was 109 years old, traveled from place to place in seven wagons pulled by 14 horses. There were 19 more horses trailing the wagons as my father was a horse trader. My mother told fortunes with cards. She could look at cards and tell you how you were going to die. She could look into your eyes and tell you the name of the person you would marry. Every night the wagon stopped in a grove of trees by a stream. The chores of us little children were to gather sticks for the fire and to feed the horses. My favorite horse was a speckled mare called Greta. Every night one of my brothers hoisted me onto Greta's back and I pretended to ride. I had seven brothers and five sisters. I was not the youngest, but I was the smallest. I was so small because I was once cursed by a tinker who did not like the fortune my mother gave him. Since we were gypsies, we belonged everywhere, so we came to the land of Poland. My father traded many horses. My mother told many fortunes. Then we were bombed by a jackboot airplane. The war had not started yet. Jackboot airplanes were simply flying about practicing for the war. The jackboot general told the pilots that they could practice on Jews and gypsies. So when a jackboot pilot saw our seven wagons full of gypsies, he immediately dropped his bombs on us, plus his goggles and everything in his pockets. Fortunately, we looked up and saw everything coming down, and as we scattered, seven, and we scattered seven wagons in seven directions. I was with my mother and father. They were sad, but I was not, because Greta, my favorite horse, was with us. Then one night, as we were camped in a grove of trees, some Polish farmers who hated gypsies even more than jackboots hated Jews came with torches and tied up my mother and father and stole me and Greta. For a long time, Greta and I were slaves for the farmers. They fed us nothing but turnips and pig's milk. Then one night, Greta broke out of her stall and ran away. The next day, I ran away too. I searched and searched for Greta and my family all over Poland. Finally, I came to the city of Warsaw, where I learned to steal food to keep from starving. I never saw Greta or my parents or my brothers and sisters again. And so, thanks to Yuri in a cellar beneath a barber shop somewhere in Warsaw, Poland, in autumn of the year 1939, I was born, you might say. With one detail missing. I waggled my yellow stone in Yuri's face. What about this? He stared. Yes. It was your father's. He gave it to you. I was greedy. What else? Before you were kidnapped, he said. That's all. I loved my story. No sooner did I hear the words than I became, I became my story. I loved myself. For days afterward, I did little else but stare into the barbershop mirror, fascinated by the face that stared back. Misha Pilsudski, I kept saying. Misha Pilsudski! Misha Pilsudski! And then it was no longer enough to stare at myself and repeat my name to myself. I needed to tell someone else. Chapter 8 I returned to the backyard with the tomato patch and the little girl of the, re of the eyes. She was not there. Neither were the tomatoes. Even the smallest green ones were gone. But arrows were there. They were painted on pieces of paper, and the papers were p pierced by twigs, and the twigs were poked into the ground. I followed the arrows. They led to a far corner of the garden. The last arrow pointed down. I dug with my fingers. I came to something. I pulled it from the dirt and brushed it off. It was the size of a walnut and it was wrapped in thin green foil. I peeled off the foil. It was a piece of chocolate-covered candy. I broke it open. It was, it was a cherry. Red juice spilled onto the ground. I ate it. I licked my fingers. It was no hazelnut buttercream, but it was close. When I looked up, the little girl was on the step. Did you like it, she said? Yes, I said, but my favorites are buttercreams with hazelnuts. I planted it in the spring, she said. I planted a potato seed. It was supposed to be a potato. 
but nobody picked it when it was time to dig potatoes. Everybody missed it. She threw her arms out and shrugged to show that everyone missed. everybody missed it. So it became candy. That's what happens when a potato stays in the ground too long. Did you know that? No, I said. My name is Misha Prosudsky. I'm a gypsy from the land of Russia. I held out my yellow stone. My father gave me this before I was kidnapped, and I told her all about myself and my family. She listened with her big eyes and her chin cupped in her hands. When I finished, she said, It's not nice to steal. What are you looking at? Your shoes, I said. I loved to look at them. They were black and sh shiny as her eyes. She held her leg out, turned her ankle this way and that. She held her foot in front of my face. Look, she said. See yourself. I looked. There I was, as clearly as in the barbershop mirror. I looked and looked, and then she was laughing. I was so intent on seeing myself that I hadn't noticed she was slowly lowering her foot. Now it rested on the step, and I was on my hands and knees, still looking. We both laughed. Then I said, Are you a Jew? She made her mouth like a fish and drew in her breath. She put her finger to her lips and shook her head. She kept her hands about my ear and whispered into it. Yes, but I'm not supposed to tell anyone. I said, Does your father scrub the sidewalk with his beard? She frowned. My father doesn't have a beard. Do you boil babies? Of course not, she said. What a stupid question. I'm a stupid boy, I said. She cocked her head and stared at me. How old are you? I don't know. Yuri had not told me that. I'm six, she said, but I'll be seven tomorrow. I'm having a birthday party. Do you want to come? I said yes. She jumped up from the step. She came and stood in front of me. She came very close until we were touching. Stand straight, she said. I stood straight. I was looking at the back of her house through the brown curls on the top of her head. Her hand appeared atop her head, smashing down on the curls, moving forward until it touched the tip of my nose. She backed away. I come up to your nose, she said. So you must be... She stared at me, thinking her finger pulled her pulled down her finger pulled down her lower lip, showing her bottom teeth, one missing. Eight. She ran to the back door. She turned and pointed to me and said in a tiny birdie voice, Don't forget, party tomorrow. She went inside. When I came the next day she was standing on the step with her hands on her hips, glaring. Beneath a black velvety wrap peeked a pink dress that came to her knees. A red bow perched on her head like a little hat. She bent toward me, and I saw the red bow reflected in her t shiny black shoes. You're late. What's late, I said. The party was supposed to start, but I told them it couldn't begin until you were here. Two of my friends already left. With an angry grunt, she pulled me up the steps and into the house. She called out, He's here! Footsteps from all directions, some running, some walking. We were in a room with a large table. On the table was food. There were glass bowls of cookies and candies, but I could not take my eyes off the cake in the middle. I had never seen such a beautiful cake. It was a rectangle in shape, and it was a garden of frosting. There were frosting flowers of blue and yellow and green, and there was a little red frosting house with blue frosting smoke coming out of the chimney, and there was even a little frosting animal that looked somewhat like a dog, but could have been a cat. Across the middle of the cake, in yellow frosting, something was written. There were grown-ups around the table and three other little girls in bright dresses who were giggling and staring at me. And then one of the women began to plant white candles into the cake. One candle went right through the red house, and then a man was leaning over with a lit match, and he put the match to each candle until all the candles were burning. I was shocked. They were going to burn down the cake! There wasn't a moment to spare. I blew out the fires, grabbed the cake, and I ran from the house. Snow flurry swirled in my face. When I told Yuri what had happened, he laughed so hard he fell into his bed. I liked it when Yuri laughed. His red hair seemed to brighten. He told me about birth. He told me then about birthday cakes and candles, and I laughed also. My running had caused the beautiful cake to crack like a bomb sidewalk. Looks like we'll just have to eat it all ourselves," said Yuri. Before he d we did, Yuri read the writing across the cracks. He told me it said, "Happy birthday, Janina." I scooped up the writing with my finger and ate that first. The next day I stole the best cake I could find from a bakery. I waited until dark and took it to the girl Janina's house. I sat it on the back step. I took the candles from my pocket and planted them in the cake. I lit them with a match. I knocked on the back door and ran. I wandered the city for the rest of the day. I did not head for home until after dark. Along the way I heard voices. I turned a corner. Fires burned in the night. My first thought was someone is having an amazing birthday party. 
but they were not candles, they were torches. Men were holding them in front of the same bakery where I had stolen the cake that day. Strudels and tor torts danced in the firelight. Behind the glass, someone painted a big yellow star on the window. A man came out of a side door. He was in his stocking feet and held a coat about, about himself. At first no one saw him. He said, hey, what are you doing? The men with the torches and paintbrushes turned to him. They were glad to see him. They came to him. They took his coat from him. One of them held his arms from behind while another painted his face with the yellow paint that had made the star. The painter took great care to paint all of the, ma the man's beard. Then they took his clothes off. The man kicked and screamed. Someone put a torch near his face and he was still. In the torchlight his eyes were fiery like the window of the bakery. The painters painted the rest of him then white and yellow from head to toe. They backed away and held the torches, the better to see him. The painted man looked like a very sad clown. The men with the torches and brushes howled with laughter. One of the paint painters reached out and paddled the rump of the painted man, setting off a new round of howls. Then someone snapped, Go! Go! And the painted man slumped back into his house. It was then that I noticed flocks of torches up and down the street. Glass shattered. I turned another corner. It was everywhere. Torches and laughter and shattering glass and painters painting windows. I heard a, vo a horse coming. Great, I thought. But it was not a speckled mare. Someone was riding the horse, but not in the usual way. He was tied to the horse, stomach down and backward. His bearded chin bobbed on the rump of the horse, and his face went in and out of the horse's tail. I thought, I'm glad I'm not a Jew. As I walked home, I looked up at the windows above the shops where the people lived. All was dark and silent. Men in the street threw stones and broke windows, but still no faces appeared. No lights went on. Early the next morning, I dragged Yuri out to sea. People were still painting on the shop windows, but this time, the painters were the bearded people, the shop owners themselves. I asked Erie, what does it say? It says Jew. Don't they already know they're Jews? They want everybody to know. Why? So nobody will come to their shops and buy from them. I thought for a minute, Erie, will you have to paint Jew on the window of the barber shop? No, but you're a Jew. In the first place, they don't even know I'm there. In the second place, who ever heard of a red-haired Jew? I thought some more. What about me? Will I have to paint Gypsy? No. Good, I said, but really I wouldn't have minded so much painting Gypsy on the window. I even thought I might like having myself painted yellow and white from head to toe, especially if they let me keep my clothes on. What I really feared was being strapped to a horse backward with my face bouncing in and out of the horse's tail. This time I said it out loud. I'm glad I'm not a Jew. Yuri said, don't be too glad. Chapter 9 Winter they came in the night. I heard them above us. Shouts, laughter, glass smashing. The hair tonic bottles. All the beautiful colors. Yuri ha ha hauled me out of bed. Coat, coat. I felt in the dark for my coat. Shoes. I grabbed my shoes. He dragged me to the ha hatch door that opened from the cellar to the backyard. Run, he said when we got outside. I wouldn't move. My candy. He smacked me. We ran. Shouts from behind us. Gunshots. The yellow stone bouncing at my throat. We ran for a long time, stopped to put on our shoes, ran. We came to the jagged walls of a bombed-out building. We picked our way through the rubble. Glass glittered in the moonlight. Frost sparkled on tumbled bricks and fallen timbers. Yuri took my hand. We went down into the rubble. Yuri felt around, found a place. Okay, he said, sleep. I slept. I dreamed I was standing under water. A waterfall, maybe, or a faucet. Splashing in my face, my eyes. I struggled to breathe. I woke up. Above me, at the edge of the rubble, stood a boy with school books strapped over his shoulder. Blue sky above him. A boy laughing, urinating in my face. Get out, Yuri shouted and threw a brick. The boy vanished. We went from that place to another and another. We slept in many places. All were cold. Sometimes I awoke with snow in my ear. Never again did we sleep in beds or sit in chairs or reach into an ice box for food. We walked the streets. Yuri kept looking about. Sometimes he pulled me quickly into a doorway or a dark space between buildings. We did not go into any shop with a star on its window. Whenever I heard a horse, I looked to see if it was Greta. Yuri had to go farther and farther to find pickles. He continued to find cans of meat and vegetables, jars of fruit and peanuts. He always took two of each. Candy he stole just for me. 
When I found a hazelnut buttercream, I could hardly chew it for laughing. I used to see the brown paper ba bread bags everywhere I went. Now there were not so many. One day when I snatched a loaf of bread, the lady called after me, Stop, dirty Jew! I stopped. I turned and faced her. I shouted back as, as sternly as I could, I'm not a dirty Jew. I'm a gypsy. My name is Misha Pilsudski. She threw her hands in the air. She stepped. She called out to the people on the sidewalk, A dirty gypsy! Stop him! She started running after me. The brown snout of her fox fur bounced up and down on her shoulder. I'd never gotten angry at a bread lady before. I turned the bag upside down and dumped the loaf to the ground. I jumped on it with both feet. I kicked it into the street. I laughed at the running lady and shouted, Dirty bread lady! and sped away. The next day I stole five loaves. As I snatched each one, I shouted my name into the face of the person. Misha Pilsudski! Misha Pilsudski! Misha Pilsudski! Misha Pilsudski! Misha Pilsudski! You cuckoo, said Yuri when I got back. It's too much. You're wasting. He took four of the loaves. I'll give it to the orphans. What are orphans, I said. Children without parents, he said. Like you? Like me? Like Cuba? Like all of us? Except for me, I have a mother and father and seven brothers and five sisters. I forgot, he said, except for you. We took the bread to the orphans. They lived in a large square house of gray stone. Yuri rang the bell. The door opened. Yuri said, Dr. Korzak, here is bread for the orphans. The man looked at us. He was bald. The hair that was not on the top of his head seemed to have fallen to the bottom of his face, as he had a dense white mustache and a goatee like a broom. He smiled and nodded. Thank you, he said. I peered into the dimness behind him, trying to catch sight of an orphan, but he was closing the door. I had an idea. The next day I snatched two loaves of bread. One I gave to Yuri, the other I took to the house of Janina the girl. It had snowed overnight. Brown stubble poked through the white blanket covering the garden. I pushed the snow from the top step. I set the loaf down, knocked on the door, and ran. The next day I came to back to look. The bread was gone. That was how it started. Chapter 10 From then on, I tried to snatch two loaves each day. I would save one for Yuri and me and leave the other on the back step of Janina's house. One time I looked up and saw her staring at me from the back window. She smiled. I smiled. I began to find things on the step where I left the bread. I found a gumdrop and a candy cigarette and a fancy button. I always looked at the window, but she was never there again. One day I left the bread and picked up a little black and white glass dog no bigger than my thumbnail. I was fascinated. I walked off, staring at the tiny dog, turning it over in my fingers. I was almost home. We were living in a stable loft then. When suddenly I turned and ran back to the house. It was in my mind to pound on the door to make her come out so I could say something to her. When I got there, someone was at the step. A boy. He turned and saw me. He stuffed the bread into his coat and ran. I ran after him, shouting, Stop! Thief! I caught up to him. I grabbed his long black coat, but he kept on running. He was a shoulder and head taller than me. I was his tail. I tripped and let go. I ran after him. We dodged in and out of people. They did not even seem to notice us. Suddenly he turned, and I ran into his fist. Next thing I knew, I was in the gutter. Pinpricks of frozen rain were falling. There was something hard in my mouth. I spit it out. It was a tooth. I reached into my pocket. The glass dog was smashed. At home, Yuri's eyes bulged when he saw me. What happened to you? I told him. You're too little to fight, he said. You don't fight. You run. He cleared, cleaned me up. He wiped blood from my face and ears and neck. When he touched my face, it hurt. He kept muttering, stupid, stupid. Next time I wasn't stupid, I went at night. There was no one on the streets. I wondered where the people were. The streetlights were like moons cupped in, in iron fingers. Behind Janina's house, there was no light at all. I ran my hand across the step. I felt something. I put it in my pocket. I put the bread on the step. I looked up at the windows, but it was even darker than the night. Somewhere in the house, Janina was sleeping. I waved at the dark, empty window and went away. Back on the street, I heard a shout. I turned. Someone stood up on the street in shadows. He stepped into the light. I heard a pop, saw a flash, felt a tug on my ear. I reached up. I couldn't feel my earlobe. Someone was shooting at me. I ducked into the nearest air shaft and made my way home along the alleyways. My ear hurt. I cried. Yuri came to me. When I told him what had happened, he flicked his cigarette lighter to see. He smacked me and stuffed a rag against my ear. Stupid. Stupid. 
I can't find my earlobe, I told him. They shot it off, he said. Who? The jackboots, who do you think? Why did the jackboots shoot my ear? Because of the curfew. What's the curfew, I said. He turned off the cigarette lighter. He was a voice in the black. Curfew means all Jews off the streets after dark. But I'm not a Jew. They shoot at you, you're a Jew. I told you not to go out at night. You don't listen. He flicked on the lighter, smacked me again, and flicked off, flicked off the lighter. It was true, he had told me. It was also true that I didn't listen. I sneaked out while he slept to show him I understood. I smacked myself. Before I went to sleep, I remembered my pocket. I pulled out the thing I had found on Janina's step. Feeling it, I could tell it was a hair bow. I guessed it was red, the one she had worn on her birthday. I put it in a bread bag where I kept all the things she left on the step. The next day, Yuri tied a rope around my wrist. Teach you a lesson, he said. We went off to meet the boys. We met them in a cemetery. They laughed when they saw me. He's on a leash. Bow, wow. Toss him a bone. Look, he was in a fight with another dog. It bit his ear off. Let him alone, Yuri said. Let me alone, I said. I have seven brothers and five sisters. They laughed even louder, but they left me alone. There was smoke blowing f there was smoke blowing Ferdy and Olick with one arm and grim faced Enos and the rest of them. But there was no pile of treasures any more, and there were no cigars, and no one threw food about. But there were cigarettes. Ferdy pulled a handful from his pocket and everyone lit up, even me. It was my first cigarette. He's smoking, exclaimed Cuba, who was a clown. He'll stunt his growth. How can he? He's already smaller than a cockroach. And then Kuba the clown charged into one-armed Olik. The two of them wrestled, but it was no match. Olik was much better with two legs than Kuba with two arms. Olik had Kuba wrapped like an octopus, Kuba squealing and flailing. Kuba grabbed Ferdy's leg and bit it. Ferdy screamed, and in a moment everyone but Yuri and grim-faced Enos was on the ground, even me with my leash. We laughed and bit and wrestled, and I think we must have looked like one squirming creature with many heads, arms, and legs. At last we peeled apart and flopped to the ground, exhausted and laughing. My ear was bleeding again and hurting. I pressed a fistful of dry grass to it. Except for Cuba, we sat on the ground and talked and laughed and smoked our cigarettes. But that didn't last long, as the frozen ground was even colder than the air. One by one we stood. We milled about. We bumped into each other and grappled. We made a game of giving and receiving bear hugs. To see who is strongest, we said, but I think it was to be close. In the cemetery, our bodies were the only fires. Some of us played hide-and-seek among the tombstones. I was it, and when I went seeking, I came upon a tombstone such as I had never seen before. Rising up from a great block of stone was a man with wings. He was looking at the sky as if he might fly off at any moment. I couldn't take my eyes away. Hey, Gypsy, came a voice. Come on, we're hiding. But I just stood there, staring up at the great stone man with wings. Soon others were standing by. Who is he, I said. It's an angel, said Ferdy. What's an angel, I said. Grim-faced Enos said, there are no angels. I looked at him. I pointed to the man with wings. So what is that? Just stone, he said. It's not real. It's something jackboots believe. I believe, said Olick. He scratched the stump of his missing arm. There are angels, you just can't see them. Why not, I said. Are they hiding? They're invisible. I looked around. I had to agree. If they were there, they were invisible, all right? Which made it especially good to have a stone statue of one. At least I could see that. What do they do, I said. They don't do horse flops, said Enos. They help people, said Olick. When you're in trouble, they help you out of it. Enos snorted. He ground out a cigarette on the foot of the stone angel. Where were they when you got pushed to the tracks and the train ran over your arm? He grabbed the empty sleeve of Olick's missing arm and flapped at it in his face. Flapped at in his face. Where were your angels then? Why didn't they roll you off the track? Why didn't they stop the train? He pointed at a boy called Big Henrik. His shoes were bank were bank coin bags. Look at him. Why don't the angels give him shoes or brains to want them? And him jabbing his finger at John, who was thin and gray and never spoke. Look at him. He's dying, and he doesn't even know it. Enos was shouting now. What are your angels doing for them? He spit on the stone angel. All was silent until the cry Jew came skimming over the tombstones. We turned to look. A black wagon was coming down the path. The lumbering horse wore a black shawl over its mane. A line of people, black shawled and lumbering like the horse, followed the wagon. It was a small wagon, a cart, just big enough to hold the coffin. 
a man was shaking his fist. Jews! Hooligan Jew boys! Filth, filthing up the cemetery. Several of the men left the line and headed toward us, shouting. We flung our cigarettes and ran. My leash flapped wildly, slapping tombstones. Suddenly, Kuba stopped. He turned his back to the men, dropped his pants, and bent over and gave them a good long look. The running men shouted louder, but no louder than we laughed. In the stable that night, in the straw-smelling darkness, I said to Yuri, Is Enos right? There are no angels? There was no answer. Are you sleeping? I'm trying to, came his voice. Your silly questions. How do I know? Enos is whatever you want him to be. You want him to be right? No, I said. I want him to be wrong. Fine. He's wrong. I want to believe in angels, I think. Fine. Believe. But Enos says angels are for jackboots. You're a jackass. That's what you are, and a silly one. And you don't say I'm stupid anymore. Now I'm silly. Take your pick. But I'm not a jackboot. How can I believe in angels? When you're nothing, you're free to believe anything. Go to sleep, Misha. I tried to go to sleep, but a question kept nagging me. Yuri? He snarled. What? Do you believe in angels? I believe in bread, he said. Now shut up or I'll come over there. I shut up. <laughs>